We're now going to look at some nonlinear equations, starting with scalar problems. We have an equation in the form x prime equals a function of t and x. Before we jump in solving these or trying to solve these problems, it's worth noting that we can at least make an illustrative picture that shows us a lot about the behavior. The picture is called a direction field. We're going to make a plot where the axes are t and x. So we'll lay down a grid of points in this plane. And we're going to use the fact that the differential equation is a statement about slope. Everywhere we're given the slope, dx dt. So if we evaluate f at one of these points, we get a slope that we can use to draw an arrow. That arrow is tangent to the solution curve that passes through that point. And we can repeat this at all the different points in the grid. The length of the arrow will show us the speed, or the magnitude of the velocity, and the direction shows us the direction of the velocity at that point. Here I'm going to use Mathematica to show a few direction fields. The equation that we're dealing with is x prime equals a function of t and x. All I have to do here is to fill in what f is, and then it'll plot the vector field for me. So let me start with um, x prime equals t minus x. So each of these arrows is a vector that is tangent to the solution curve at that point. So remember we have uh, an infinite family of solutions usually and um, an initial condition that would make it unique. So if I picked an initial condition where my cursor is, the solution would be headed in this direction. So as uh, with this field here, and as t increases, it wants to go up more vertically, but as x increases, it wants to go uh, down. So those two forces are competing as we change x or as we change t. So you get an idea of which way solutions are going to go. On this side, uh, they're going to decrease for a while, but ultimately everybody's going to increase uh, because of the t. If I were to make the effect of x stronger here, right, then you can see that there are, along a sideways parabola, there are points where the solution is actually going straight to the right, where the tangent is horizontal. Uh, that curve, this parabola in this case would be called a null cline. And then the solution is either increasing or decreasing on either side of the null cline. If the equation doesn't depend on t, or if the function, I should say, doesn't depend on t, and of course you get the same picture for every horizontal line. I'm sorry, you get the same picture for every vertical line. And here you can see that, for instance, if we started at zero, we'd stay at zero forever. Zero is an equilibrium point of this equation. Similarly, it looks like there's an equilibrium point in here. All the arrows are pushing us into what's presumably a straight horizontal line in between here. So you get a pretty good idea of the global behavior of a system from this picture. There's a particular special case known as an autonomous equation. That's when this function f is independent of t. The equation itself makes no explicit mention of the t variable. In this kind of a problem, as we've seen before, we're interested in equilibrium solutions. If x star is a value of x that makes f equal to 0, then x equal to x star is a constant solution of the equation. A 
and that's what we call an equilibrium solution or a fixed point. For autonomous problems, there's a different kind of picture we can use called a phase line diagram. The idea is that we can use the sine of f of x at different values of x to deduce the stability of the fixed points. Here's an example of an autonomous equation. This function here is what we call f of x. So we're trying to find where x prime equals 0. That means we're finding the roots of f. And f is pretty straightforward to factor. So we have equilibria at negative 1, 0, and 3. We can make a table what happens to the sine of f at different values of x. So if x is less than negative 1, we have a positive times a negative times a negative, so the whole thing is positive. If x is between minus 1 and 0, then the sine of the last factor changes, but the others don't, so f of x is negative. When we cross into 0, 3, now it's positive. When it's greater than 3, it's negative again. So now the axes on this graph are x and f of x. We want to mark down the fixed points of the equation. And then we'll just sketch what f of x does. Quantitatively, it's not really important. The thing that we want to know here is the sine of f. The reason is that f is equal to dx dt. So the sine of f tells us whether the solution is increasing, wherever f is positive, And it tells us that the solution is decreasing, where f is negative. And now, the motions along the axis make it pretty clear that the fixed point at negative 1 and that the fixed point at 3 are stable. Solutions get pushed into them, whereas at the origin, solutions get pushed away, so that's unstable. The best known technique for solving nonlinear problems is called separation of variables. You've probably seen it in a calculus course. If the equation can be written as dx dt is a function of x times a function of t, then the problem is separable and this technique should work. So for example, any autonomous problem is separable g of t equal to 1. We just rewrite it with all the x's on the left and all the t's on the right. And now both sides are in a form that we can integrate. When I do the integrals, I'll get an arbitrary constant on both sides, but I can add those together and make them a single constant c. And then we can solve for x. What we get is a general solution with an arbitrary constant in it, but it's not appearing in the same form as it did in a linear problem as c times a homogeneous solution. Now, if we also had the initial condition, x sub 0 equals x naught, we can put that into the solution and solve for c. When we put that back into the solution, we can rearrange it. So 
there's our solution for any initial value. It's worth pointing out, since we divided by x0 at one point, what happens if x0 is 0? Does that cause a problem? Well, actually, in this case, that would mean x of t equals 0, and that does satisfy the equation x prime equals x squared. So often in separation of variables, there might be an exceptional value like this that you have to check separately. Notice that the solution does not exist for all t. It becomes infinite at t equals x0. That's something we didn't see with linear problems. Here's another separable case. It's actually autonomous. We put the x's on the left and the t's on the right and integrate both sides. When we solve for x, I'm actually going to take c over 2, but c is an arbitrary constant, so I'll just rename that as c again. So that's a general solution for different values of c. Let's suppose we had the initial condition that x of 0 is 0. If you put 0 in both sides, you find out that c is equal to 0, so x equals t squared is a solution. But also, 0 is an equilibrium solution. That means the solution to this initial value problem isn't unique. That's another thing that can't happen with linear problems that does happen in some nonlinear problems. Here's another example of separation. The fact that it's division instead of multiplication doesn't matter. You can still put x's on one side and t's on the other. Now when we look at this result, should we try to solve for x as a function of t? That's actually a pretty bad idea. I'm not even sure that we could figure it out. But even if we did, it would be a pretty bad expression. Sometimes an implicit solution is the best we can do. An implicit solution means that there's some function of t and x that equals 0. That's more general than an explicit solution where x is a function of t. Finally, let me give you an example that's sneaky in a way that math professors like. This function doesn't immediately look separable until you remember that we can write this as the product of two exponentials. And suddenly, it's easy to see how to do separation of variables. And this time, we can solve for x.